All right, everybody, good evening. For those watching online and you that are here, be sure to get the outline in the back. It's a new topic tonight. Think about the human body that you had. If you hadn't picked up an outline, please do. Somebody's written these words, and so true, and it'll be on any medical chart for sure. The human body is the most fantastically complex machine ever put together. Nothing man has ever built, including all the amazing nuclear and electronic devices over the past decades, approaches that human body with sophistication or the interdependence of processes, variety of parts, materials, the subtleness of action, prolonged power, flexibility, regeneration, and plain capability. Think about your body. How does this grab you? Your body has 222 distinct bones, several trillion hardworking cells. Your body has 639 muscles, and from three to five gallons of blood with over 60 different constituents. You have several miles of nerves in your body, arteries and veins, and over a thousand specialized small parts and about 10 major organs. Those major organs alone perform such unique feats as electronic conduction of chemical transformation. I mean, it would take a book to just explain each one of those that I describe. Remember what David said? I will praise thee, for I am fearfully and wonderfully made. Marvelous are thy works, and my soul knows it well. And the wonders of the human body are even greater when we think about that God himself indwells our body. When we experience salvation, remember what Paul said, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which is in you, which you have of God, and you're not your own? You are bought with a price, Therefore, glorify God with your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's 1 Corinthians 6, 19 and 20. Not only that, our bodies of believers here are sealed and secured and protected until God redeems us fully with a new body. Remember what Paul said also, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom you trusted, and after, after you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom you believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest, or we could say the down payment of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession. You are a purchased possession of God to the praise of his glory. That is why God asked us to present our body to Jesus so that we can serve him. We will either, either serve Jesus or be a poor witness of his saving grace. We, and as the corporate body, are going to be instruments of righteousness or instruments of sin, Romans 6. And that's what I want to talk about tonight as we move to a new topic. We're moving to a section called the Doctrine of Man, if you have the book. And tonight's topic is the creation of man, the creation of man. So I hope you have your outline. In the previous chapters, if you've been with us, we talked about the nature of God, his trinity and his attributes. We talked about the universe that he's made. The last several weeks, we talked about the spiritual beings that he made, angels, and God's relationship to the world as we even did, as I started, with prayer. But tonight, we're going to focus on the pinnacle of God's creation, man and woman, humanity. And we will use the term man generically, are human beings as we go through the book. So, human beings, we are the pinnacle of God's creation. Now, if you got the outline, just focus in on it right from the get-go. Why was man created? Now, we said in chapter 5, and it's very true, God did not need to create us. He created us for his glory. He didn't create us because he was lonely and needed us. There was a complete fellowship within the Trinity. So, but the fact that he did create us, listen, listen, that guarantees that each one of us is important. And you might know somebody, a young person, an older person, that just feel like they don't count. In fact, they might have isolated themselves and think their life is not even worth living 
you might have a ministry to somebody like that. Stop and think about that. Because that's what the enemy always wants to do, isolate and destroy. But we are significant because God has made each one of us. And if we, let her be, if we are truly important to God for all eternity, what greater measure of importance or significance could we want? We belong to God. He loved us. He redeemed us. So, a fascinating thought. Male and female, he created them, and he blessed them. That's what it said in Genesis. All right, so as we move now, right in here, number two, what is our purpose in life? Ready? We are to glorify God and to take delight in him, in our relationship to him. I'll say it again. We are to enjoy God and to take delight in him and our relationship to him. And this is certainly scriptural because Jesus said, I have come to give you life and to give it to you abundantly. We are created for his glory. We can go not only to, I, to Ephesians, but chapter 43 of Isaiah. Uh, talking about all the people, sons and daughters from the ends of the earth, whom I created for my glory. That's what God said. That's Isaiah. All right. So Jesus said he come to, he's come to give us abundant life. And David said this. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are the pleasures forevermore. And I wonder over the last day or two or week, have you been able to enjoy God and say there's pleasure in your presence? It's a wonderful thing, isn't it, that we should do. And not only that, David, Psalm 27, he longs. David said, I want to behold the beauty of the Lord. And Asaph. Psalm 73, when he got very angry about the wicked, you know, having success in the world, and it looked like the righteous were suffering, and we can certainly look at that and maybe come to the same conclusions today. But then Asaph came to himself. Psalm 73, 25 and 26, and he said, Whom do I have in heaven but thee? Now you'll see him on the screen now. But there is none upon earth that I desire besides thee. My flesh and my heart may fail, but God is the strength of my heart, and my portion forever. Oh, what a wonderful set of verses there. So fullness of joy is knowing God and delighting in the excellence of his character. It's rejoicing in the Lord. In fact, we go to Romans 5. I'm going to take some of these and look at the. I'd like you to go to Romans. Oh, we'll see it on the screen, hopefully. Romans 5. By the way, Jim has done all this ahead of time, and it so helps me. He does a lot of work. By whom you have access, we have access, absolutely. Let's give him a hand. I don't, I don't mean to continue to, but I'm going to say this. He was out here, we heard, two and a half hours just cleaning up today. That's dedication. I'm telling you, he's dedicated. But think about this. We all should be dedicated to the Lord as he is. We have access by faith and the disgrace in which we stand. You stand in grace. And so, as a result, we should rejoice and hope in the glory of God. There's great rejoicing going on. And a couple others, we know Philippians 4.4, 4, rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Uh, let's go to the James one there. If we can go to James 1. Uh, this is interesting that James has this to say. James had a lot to say about joy. even was through trials. James chapter 1, verse 2, if you can find that. And... Uh, while we're turning to that one, I'm going to turn to another one. If you, can, we'll, if you can't get it, we'll turn to it. I want you to turn to 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter 1. I found it, so I'll just read it. Consider it all joy when you fall into devious temptations, or you could say when you encounter various trials. That don't seem like occasion to rejoice, but it's what it's going to produce. It's what the, the rejoicing is looking ahead to what is going to be developed in my life, character, endurance, Patience, wisdom. So that's what we rejoice in. Not always the immediate, but what we're going to have as a result of the trial. And Peter, I love Peter here, 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 6 through 8. He, already, he says the same thing that Paul did in verse 4, that we have this great inheritance. It's not going to fade away. Nobody can steal it from you. 
It's reserved in heaven for you. It's protected by the power of God, and you're kept by faith. Verse 6, in this you greatly rejoice, even though for a season, if need be, you're in heaviness through manifold, again, temptations, or you could translate it, trials. Why? So that the proof of your faith, more precious than gold, even though tested by fire, will result in what? Praise and glory and honor. So you praise him going into the trial, even though you don't feel like it. You go through the trial, and after the trial is done, you'll be able to praise him for what he's done. Start with praise. You end with praise. That's the way Peter's talking about it. So again, the whole idea of rejoicing. So let us see on the outline, the normal heart attitude of a Christian is rejoicing in the Lord and in the lessons of the life he gives us. That is not to say that we don't have sorrow or sadness or he's not negating our emotions, but the normal life of us should be rejoicing in the Lord and in the lessons of the life that he gives us. I will move to another one, 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And here, yeah, it's rejoice evermore and keep going, verse the next two, pray without ceasing and everything give thanks for this is the will of God. Doesn't mean you feel like giving thanks and everything, but you give thanks. Again, it's the result. It's the result of what God's going to do. That's why we rejoice. That's why we pray. So, on the outline, man is made in the image of God. Let us make man to be like us and to represent us. And I will say one other passage about the rejoicing. As the bridegroom, this is Isaiah 62, 5, as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. And Zephaniah 3 is really interesting. Zephaniah 3, verses 17 and 18. It says, the Lord will rejoice over you with gladness. He will renew you in his love. He will exalt over you literally with loud singing. You realize God sings over you? That's a powerful thought, isn't it? He does. So we're to rejoice. He rejoices over us. And that's just really incredible. Now we're going to move to the, what is exactly the image of God in man? What does that mean? We're made in the image of God. Let us make man in our image and our likeness. In the Hebrew parallel, he says it one way, then he says it another way. The Hebrew word for image, tesla, and the Hebrew word for likeness, demut, refer to something that is similar but not identical to the thing it represents. That's a, good, that's a good Hebrew, which was a very picture language. So the words image and likeness, what does that mean? What did it mean for the original readers? So let us make man to be like us and to represent us. That's the idea. So image and likeness have these meanings. Now, here's the problem. And this goes back to what I've heard some of you say recently about how the saved, well, the unsaved will say, well, I'm a child of God. I'm made in the image of God. And some will even quote Malachi. Are we, is God not our, the father of us all? See, they'll yank something out of context. Have you ever heard an unbeliever say something of that nature? As if they're okay. Here's the problem. The fall. That's when God's image was distorted in us. Not completely lost, but distorted. So this is what happened after man and woman sinned. So early on in Genesis, God gives Noah the authority to establish the death penalty for murder among human beings after the flood. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. That's Genesis 9. It's, James says the same thing. We should not murder James 3, 9, because we are made in the image of God. I would get off there politically. I won't. But it is, it is scriptural. Romans 13. We already went over that. Talking to God, said, Paul said, the government is the instrument of God. It doesn't bear the sword for nothing. It didn't say, well, this is what the Roman government's doing. No, he started, the government is the instrument of God. And you look at, I looked up every time word study, like word studies, with that sword is what it means, to execute. Okay, so anyway, 
That's the side trail. But because we're, everybody's made in the image of God, yes, all people, but the image has been distorted. As a result, and you think about this, and I'm quoting Gruden because he's got a good way of explaining here. His moral purity has been lost. His sinful character certainly does not reflect God's holiness. His intellect is corrupted by falsehood and misunderstanding. His speech no longer glorifies God. His relationships are governed by selfishness rather than love and so forth. So man is still in the image of God, yet in every aspect of life, this image has been distorted or lost. Thus, man is lost and needs to be saved to regain the image of what? The new Adam. So next time a lost person says, well, I'm a child of God in the image of God, take them back to Genesis and what happened there if they believe the Bible. So after the fall, we're still like God. We still represent God, but that image has been distorted. And listen, we are less like God than we were before the entrance of sin. So that's why the image has been distorted. And that's why I take Genesis literally, not some pre-Adamic race beforehand or millions of years, because in Genesis 1.31, what did God say about his creation? It's very good. He couldn't say it's very good if sin was already in the, in the picture among mankind. That happened afterwards. Now, we think about redemption in Christ. So as we become believers, there's a progression we're becoming more and more like Jesus. I hope you're more like him now than you were three years ago or five years ago. It's a progression. We're growing. And, in fact, Paul said that in Colossians 3. We're being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And the more we learn about God and grow close to him and his word, we'll begin to think more and more of God's thoughts in the world. And 2 Corinthians 3 is a favorite one. We are being changed into his likeness. That's the Greek word for image. From one degree of glory to another. You could say from one level to another. From glory to glory, day by day. We're growing, and I hope you are. From one degree. And by the way, your, your progress may be, you may be ahead of somebody else. Somebody may be behind you. It's okay. We're on our own lane, if you will, in the race. <laughs> Don't worry about what somebody else is doing. All right? We're, God's working on us individually. We're Christians under construction. It's a great book with that title. So as through this life, we're growing into maturity and to, like, to be like Christ. And the goal, Romans 8, 29, is that we will be conformed to the image of his son. So at Christ's return, that's when it's complete, when we get when we go to heaven and when, when, he, when he comes back for us, we get finally our new redeemed body. We shall be like him. We shall see him as he is. Just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, this is 1 Corinthians 15, 49, so we will bear the image of the man of heaven. Wonderful thought. So, in fact, Jesus is made, he's the image of God. He's the human being. So, Jesus is the perfect human being, and so he's the, he's the image of the invisible God, Colossians 1, 15. When he appears, we shall be like him, 1 John 3, 2. All right, now let's write in here on the outline, are you ready, under number one, man is like God in the following ways, intellectual ability, moral purity, Spiritual nature, dominion over the earth. He still has given us that. Creativity, the ability to make ethnical, ethnical choices. I left out the end of my word. And then immor immortality. So let's think about those for a moment. We go back to the first one. We, we are morally accountable to God. And I said Sunday, through two or three Sundays now, I don't answer to you, you don't answer for me. Now, we can iron sharpens iron. We want to help each other, but we ultimately answer to God. Correct? And think of the spiritual aspects for a moment. We not only have physical bodies, but we have immaterial spirits. And that's what we're going to focus on through the rest of this book. 
And then think about our mental aspects. We have the ability to reason and think logically. That sets us apart from the animal world. Now, animals have remarkable behaviors. In fact, the things I see on social media it, it continue to baffle me, honestly, with what they do with even wild animals. But, but they don't solve problems in the world. Okay, We're certainly different. And so they don't engage like somebody he put in here, the history of canine philosophy. You don't see dogs or a group of chimpanzees sitting around a table, table arguing about the doctrine or the merits of Calvinism and Arminianism. It just doesn't happen. <laughs> okay? Does it mean animals don't have a soul or a personality? They certainly do. God created them, so they're very important. But, and this is another thought that Wayne brought out that I thought was really good. We have not only physical and technical skills, but we can develop them. That, different, that makes us far different from the animals. Beavers still build the same kind of dams they have built for a thousand generations. Birds still build the same kind of nest. Bees still make the same kind of hives, but we continue to develop greater skill and complexity and technology and in agriculture and science and every, every field of endeavor. Remember Daniel said in the latter times, men will increase in knowledge, right? Remember that? But on the other hand, it doesn't mean the people before us are just less intelligent. Like somebody said, we're just building upon what they have established, too. So there's two ways to look at that. But certainly that obviously makes us different from the animal world. And think about relationships for a moment. We have the ability to praise God and relate to him, but think about we can relate to each other. And although animals do have a sense of community, that's very obvious, with each other, the depth of that interpersonal harmony is not going to be the same like it's experienced in human marriage and in a human family you know, that operates according to God's principles or a church where we are community believers walking together. And some of you may correct me on this. I'm probably going out of bounds on this one, but I've had pets before too. It's, usually my, it's my estimation they respond more to your tone of voice or the command or, the, or the, more than the name. I could be off on that, but that was my experience with my pets anyway. But as I go jogging, here comes this dog chasing me, and they're saying, Rover, stop, Rover. Rover's not going to stop. Rover's going to bark and come after me. <laughs> you know, it's just the nature of a dog and the nature of a cat. And yet they are made with, I believe, certainly with personalities, no doubt about it. But we obviously see the difference. And that's, again, between the evolutionists that say you're just an evolved animal, then what's to say who's right and who's wrong? Whose standard are we going to go by? So we have great dignity and being the bearers of God's image. And so, powerful thought here, great dignity. And think about this. When you realize we are more significant than any other thing, we think about the starry universe that you can go out and look at, or the abundant earth, or the world of plants and animals, or the angelic beings, magnificent, but we are more like our creator than any of those things. We are the pinnacle of God's creation. So God made us to give him glory. Now let's talk about the, so let's go back and I review the outline in case I didn't miss anything. Number two, God's image is distorted and lost. So people need to be saved. The image has been distorted and lost and now we are alienated from God. And so I already repeated the Genesis there with Noah. And I already basically said those things going through Grudem. So, I actually, Ecclesiastes 7 is a good one. God made man upright, but they have sought out many devices, in essence, to try to become God. Number three, the redemption in Christ. There's this progressive recovery once we become a believer. So, redemption in Christ, letter little a, means that we can, in this life, progressively grow into more and more likeness to God. We can progressively move, or you could say progressively grow, into more and more likeness to God. And we already went over little b, those passages there. Number four, at Christ's return, this is when there'll be this complete restoration. Letter little a under four. The promise of the New Testament is that just as we have been like Adam, subject to death and sin, 
subject to death and sin, we shall be like the new Adam, Jesus Christ, morally pure, never subject to death again. Did you get all that? So we have been like Adam, subject to death and sin. We will be like the new Adam, Jesus Christ, morally pure, never subject to death again. And we went over those passages. When he appears, we shall be like him. Number five, there are specific aspects to our likeness to God. The moral aspects. We are morally accountable to him for our actions. And God has given us this inner sense of right and wrong. This sets us apart from the animals. They have a little innate sense of justice. Now they can defend themselves. They will. They are, the fear of man is put in them by large. But they typically respond from fear of punishment or hope of reward. When we act according to God's moral standards, our likeness to God is reflected in our behavior that is holy and righteous. I put mis, it shouldn't be that, that. In holy and righteous, you could put behavior or righteousness before him, misprint there. But by contrast, our unlikeness to God is reflected whenever we sin. So you could say God is reflected in our behavior and is holy and that we should be, I guess that's the way to put it there, sorry about that, that we should be holy and righteous before him. You can add that in, that we should be. That's talking about our behavior because I want you to write down a verse right there, Ephesians 1.6. Ephesians 1.6, though, says we are accepted in the beloved one. So we are already seen as holy and righteous in position. You understand that? Positionally, we are in Christ. But in our behavior, we should grow more and more into holy and righteous behavior before him. Because everything we do is before him. All right, little c. Spiritual aspects. We have physical bodies and we have immaterial spirits. Moving on to E, mental aspects. We do have the ability to reason and to think logically. Our likeness to God is illustrated by the use of complex, abstract language. And for some of you, I put myself there. Remove the word complex. <laughs> I'm not that complex. But we can think abstractly, right? Our awareness of the distant future, animals don't have that, and the entire spectrum of human create, creative activity, such as in areas of art, music, literature, and science. You think about those four areas, art, music, literature, and science, the unsaved world will use those four vehicles to move people away from God. Now you stop and think about those areas. Art. That can be movies. That can be all sorts of things. Uh, social media and music and literature and science. Those areas can be used to glorify God or to defame God. There could be more. The relational aspects, the community of believers, we're called the body of Christ. We have this interpersonal harmony. So much why God says, don't disrupt the unity of the body. Have you ever been part of a church where they had fractions and splits and dissensions? It happens, doesn't it? That's not the, that's not the will of God, for sure. The starry universe, the whole earth, the world, of the animals and the angelic world I've already mentioned, but we're more like our creator than any of these. Even fallen sin sinful man does have the status of the image of God, but let us remember it's distorted, it's lost, and, God, and so mankind needs to be saved. Now, we come to the essential nature of man, and here's the more technical terms. You've probably heard them before. Trichotomy, dichotomy, and monism. I actually had not heard of that third one myself, actually, in that how it's defined. So we're going to, how many parts are there to man? We know we have a body, unless you just are some, you know, people that have some 
mystical religion and says, well, this is not really real. I went in philosophy class. How do we know the table is real? I mean, we're just going to be under the head spinning our head, you know, alphabet soup. We're going to be, God's given us senses to know what's real and what isn't. But we, we can have a physical world. We have physical bodies. But most people do believe, Christians and non-Christians, that we do have an immaterial part, a soul that will live on after the, their bodies die. So, some people believe in addition to the body and the soul, we have a third part, spirit. So, right in under little b under number one. The view that man is made up of three parts, right in body, soul, and spirit, is called trichotomy. I lean more toward that position based on the way that I view flesh and old nature. And I'll, that's not a topic for tonight. But in our discipleship class, we're going to get into that deep and we're going to learn about it. But because of my view on that, I tend to lean more toward the trichotomy side. That, but, and, the, and he puts in according, and this is Rain Grudem, according to most holding this view, and of course he doesn't, and he, <laughs> he definitely slants things toward his belief for sure, but he says, Man's soul includes his intellect, his emotions, and will. And so the trichotomists maintain that all people have a soul and that different elements of the soul can either serve God or be yielded to, I missed another one, yielded to sin. Put the S in there, sorry. Yielded to sin. They argue that a man's spirit is a higher faculty that comes alive when a person becomes a Christian. Let's go to these for a moment. Uh, Romans 8. Romans 8. And they are, soul and spirit are used interchangeably too. That's what makes it a little bit, uh, we'll talk about the dichotomous. But Romans 8, here we are. If you are in Christ, the body is dead. There's another verification that you know, a person's lost. They're dead because of sin. But the spirit is life. The Spirit regenerates us, brings us to a place of being born again because of righteousness. And likewise, John 2.24, I hope some of he some of these he had in the book I actually thought were misprints, but um, John 2.24. Yeah, Jesus did not commit himself to the, to them because he knew all men. It goes on to say he knew what was inside of men, their spirits. So again, as we look at this. Letter C, another view is dichotomy. This is the view that teaches spirit is not a separate part of man, but just another term for soul, and that both terms are used interchangeably to talk about the immaterial part of man. Is everybody with me? The, di the trichotomist says that spirit and soul are separate, still part of the immaterial part. The material part's our body. The dichotomist says we got the physical body, but soul and spirit is just the same terms. They're just used interchangeably. Everybody understand that? Are you with me? Okay, so, so they use that to talk about the immaterial part of man. That is, that part that lives on after our bodies die. Therefore, under C, man is under the dichotomist, is made up of two parts, body and spirit. Those who hold this view, I think I missed the W there, often agree that Scripture uses the word spirit, that's the Hebrew word ra and the Greek word pneuma, most frequently when referring to our relationship to God. But such usage, they say, is not uniform. The word soul is also used in all the ways that spirit can be used. Now let me go to the third one. This is an odd one. And really outside of, yes, Virginia. Sure, we'll back up. Yeah, I was filling them in. Which one did you miss? I'll go back to C. First one under C. Yes, Scripture uh, is to talk about, interchangeably in Scripture, to talk about the immaterial, put immaterial part of man. I guess you could probably even use the word invisible. That would be just as valid, invisible. 
or in material. That part lives on after our bodies die. Now moving on, therefore, man is made up to, of two parts. This is the, the, the dichotomous. Body and soul spirit. Yes. Now I'll go down to deep. The third one, and this is really outside of Christian thought. This is a view that man cannot exist at all apart from a physical body. So there can be no separate existence for the soul after the body dies. And so this view can allow for the resurrection of a whole person. At the future time, this view is called monism. According to monism, the terms soul and spirit are expressions of the perfect person or for one's life. So not really. That really, Scripture cancels that one out pretty quickly. And let's look at a few. Uh, let's go to Acts 7, 59. We, the Luke one refers to our Lord. But Acts 7, 59, this is Stephen calling upon God and saying, what did he say? Lord Jesus, what? Receive my spirit. Receive, <clears throat> excuse me, receive my spirit. And 2 Corinthians 5, 8, a familiar one. Second, I'm confident, I say, willing rather to be absent from the body and go into sleep? No, what? Soul sleep? Nope, to be present with the Lord. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. And Hebrews 12, 23, a very good one. To the general assembly in the church of the firstborn, that's us, which are written in heaven. We're already names are up there. And to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men, men made perfect. And we, in Revelation, we learned about that. Let's go to Revelation 6, 9. You that were in Revelation. He opened the fifth seal, and I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. Revelation 24. I saw thrones, and they sat upon them, and judgment was given to them. That's the people that are up there. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and the word of God. And they had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither received his mark upon their foreheads or in their hands. So they were slain, and they lived on and reigned with Christ for what? A thousand years. And we, we just, that relishes when we go, when we were in Revelation, right? So there's the, the proof about the spirit living on. Number two, there is strong emphasis of the Bible on the unity of man. And that goes back to Genesis, which we will not look at. But when Christ returns, we're, we're fully redeemed with new bodies as well as souls to live with him forever. We will live in this unified and harmonious state. Let's go to 1 Corinthians 15, the blessedness of what Paul wanted to reassure the Corinthians about. I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. That means to die, but we shall all be changed in a moment. In the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, for the trumpet will sound. That's the voice of, God, of Jesus, by the way. And the dead will be raised incorruptible, and we shall be metamorphosized, transformed, changed. For this corruptible, that's what we are now, must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on what? Immortality. Immortality. That's a great truth. And 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1, I want to look at that one. Having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh. Warren Wearsby, great author, says that the let us cleanse is actually a one-time thing. You do that when you're saved. And then the perfecting, of holiness is what goes on throughout our whole life. I'm not sure that I could see it that way. I could see it both ways, that we're continually cleansing ourselves and we're continuing to perfect holiness in the fear of God. So that's a great verse. In the flesh, get rid of the filthiness of the flesh and what? The spirit. So the Bible does teach about an immaterial part of man's nature. Man is said to either be body or soul, and body and soul, or body and spirit. All right, let's move on to letter E. Everything that the spirit is said to do, the soul is also said to do. 
Let's go to 1 Corinthians 2.11. And it is true that the, uh, they are used, soul and spirit are used interchangeably at times. And yet they also seem to be used separately. So have you found, you got that, Jim? 1 Corinthians 2.11. For what man knoweth the things of a man, save the spirit of man which is in him? Even so, the things of God knoweth no man but the Spirit of God. So you've got a, the Spirit of God, and then you've got the Spirit of man. So we can know because of the Spirit that is within us. So as we move on to the outline, the trichotomist, that's the person that believes in body and soul and spirit, body being the material part, the physical, the invisible would be for that person soul and spirit. And the spirit is made alive when the person becomes a believer. So the trichotomist claims that the spirit is the element of us that relates most directly to God in worship and in prayer and generally thinks of the spirit as purer than the soul. And when renewed, it, that, then the spirit is free from sin and responsive to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Let's go to 1 Thessalonians 5.23. 1 Thessalonians 5. And here we are, and this is probably the proof text for the trichotomous. And the very God of peace sanctify you wholly. I pray, God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless until the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Christ. And I, to me, that's a strong one. But it is certainly true that at times they do seem to be used interchangeably. And uh, let's see Mark. I don't, let's go to Mark 12, 30. I, one of them I thought, yeah, this is, the, this is the, the commandment. Jesus said, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart. That would be like your mind. The heart is the, word, he, the Old Testament word for our mind. With all your soul, or he's got mind in there. Your heart would be that immaterial part, your soul and your mind. With all your strength, this is the first commandment. So he's making that trichotomy uh, there again. Now, what does it mean as we look at this? Questions, all right? And let's go, I want to go back to Grudem. So a couple of things that he does point out in his defense of the dichotomy view. For example, I didn't put this in the outline, but Paul warn the Corinthian church to deliver the erring brother to Satan for the destruction of the flesh. But notice then he said, but that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord Jesus. That does tell us there are carnal Christians. So, James says the body apart from the spirit is dead. James 2.26. And I love 1 Corinthians 7, 34. The unmarried woman is concerned about how to be holy in body and in spirit. In body and in spirit. And also what Grudem says, and it is, I would certainly say to be true, everything that the soul is said to do, the spirit is also said to do. And everything that the spirit is said to do, the soul is also said said to do. I'll give you a couple of scripture examples. Paul's spirit was provoked within him. That's Acts 17, 16. It says of John 13, Jesus was troubled in spirit. If you're ever troubled in spirit, would you remember that Jesus was at times troubled in spirit? It's possible to have a downcast spirit, depression, which is opposite of the cheerful heart, Proverbs 17, 22. So there is where they are used interchangeably. In the Psalms, say this a lot, Psalm 25. To you, O Lord, I lift up my soul. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. That's Psalm 62. Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless his holy name. Praise the Lord, O my soul. My soul magnifies the Lord. So Wayne would be saying, look, here are verses where the soul is said to be glorifying God, not just the spirit. And it's true. So I don't know. <laughs> I don't have a definitive. I mean, we obviously know 
that we have an invisible, immaterial part, no doubt about it. That's, that's what we need to face in on and, and center in on. Whether it's a dichotomy or a trichotomy, I can't be absolutely certain, but those are the two views when it comes down to it. What was the purpose? I'm asking you now, what was the purpose for which God created man? What would you say? You can go back to the outline. What's the purpose why he created you and me? Glorify him. George, you got it, but to serve him, both. That would be actually be we do glorify him by serving him. And what is the primary purpose of our lives? You probably just said that one too. To serve him. But here's another thing. To enjoy him. We don't serve him out of grudgingly or out of guilt, which a lot of Christians do. So we serve him out of love, right? We love him because he first loved us. What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Go back to the outline. Remember, there's the, what does it mean? Well, we have the intellectual ability. We have a spiritual nature that sets us apart from animals. We're creative. We can make ethnical choices. We have immortality, okay? Immortality. And in what ways is our existence like God's? What would you say? What ways is our existence like God? Our character, absolutely. We want to be conformed to the image of Christ. I guess we could say we're going to live forever, right? Immortality. What effect did the fall of mankind have on being made in the image of God? Unbeliever says, why, man? Because it says in Malachi, we're all of... God's the father of us all. I'm a child of God. What would you say? Distorted. We're lost, right? According to Scripture, well, yeah, he, just like my discipleship guy tends to repeat questions, I put what should be the major purpose of your life. You might add, even with your spiritual gifts that God's given you, what, how can you serve God? Let me ask you real quick. I'm going, do you know what your spiritual gift is? And do you know how you're using your spiritual gift? How does it make you feel that you as a human being are more like God than any other creature in the universe? How does it make you feel? I hope special and significant, right? And I'll conclude with this. I'm sure Greg's probably got a song. Decades ago, Dr. Gene Rosenbaum was, a, was the president, this is decades ago, of the New Mexico Psychoanalytical Association, Dr. Rosenbaum said this, letting others run your life for you can cause you to suffer from gradual personality disintegration. Each time you sit back and let someone else tell you how to run your life, you are adding to your unhappiness. You are taking away from yourself as an individual. Dr. Rosenbaum went on to say this, giving this advice. Since the world can be divided into those that lead and those that follow, the shy or the timid person finds himself automatically cast with the followers, even when he has qualities which should make him, or we could say her, a leader. To get over shyness or excessive timidity, you need to raise your level of self-esteem. Learn to assert yourself by building up your personality, first to yourself and to others. Make a list of your good qualities, your special abilities, and your achievements, and memorize that list. Let me stop and pause and say it. Some of those things are not wrong. We should make a list of the strengths that we are. We, sure, we should learn to be able to speak up. Then capitalize on the things you do well. If you see yourself as a person who has worth, others will also. And learn to develop habits of tactful refusal when a friend or a relative tells you what you should be doing. If you disagree with him, say so, but do it tactfully. Be firm when others are trying to take over your life. Don't, let, don't back down out of fear of reprisals or fear of rupturing a friendship or family relations or fear of being impolite or rude. Ensure yourself against others running your life by developing habits of decision and projecting an image of control and capability. Remember, in letting other people run your life, you're building up their egos. 
their personalities and self-esteem. Your first obligation is to yourself. Now, although there's some good things in there, what is that really? Humanism, right? Be you're your own king, ruler. Don't let others run your life. Who knows us better than God? So that psychoanalyst did ask the right question. Who knows more about us and what we need? God, right? God made us. He sent his son to redeem us. Thou hast searched me, Lord. Thou knowest me. You know when I sit down? You know when I rise up. You discern my thoughts from afar. Oh, you've traced my walking and my resting and are familiar with all my ways. Even when there's before a word was on my tongue, oh, Lord, you know it perfectly. You've closed me in. You have placed your hand upon me. Such knowledge is too wonderful for me. It's inaccessible for me to reach. Do you not know? that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, which you have of God, and you're not your own. You were bought with a price. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. That's why Paul said the love of Christ controls us. If he died for all, then we should no longer live for ourselves, but for him who died and rose again. If God owns us, he certainly can tell us what to do. Our peace is dependent upon our obedience to him. Right. Let's close in prayer. Lord, we thank you tonight that we can meet in your name and worship you and think about that you created us higher and greater and above any other thing that you created in all the universe. Thank you, God. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, see you Sunday.